Let's pray. Father, as we turn to your word, your, the word of, that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Church of Colossae, we pray that uh, it will be your word to us tonight, that you will be pleased with what is said, with what is heard, and uh, that it may accomplish your purpose in our lives. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I was dressed this morning for tonight, but after the announcement, I changed my dress. So here, here I am. I, I'm a Chiefs fan, but I'm going to preach while they play. So uh, if, uh, if you put slide number one up, um, we'll, we'll look at the location of Colossae. I don't know if you can, how well you can see that. But uh, you might remember that when Smed preached about the seven churches of Revelation, they're on the Asia Minor, and that's there. Ephesus is down there somewhere. I can't see it, but it's there. And Colossae is about 100 miles to the south uh, east of, of Ephesus. So that's the location. And I'm not sure if you can see the green line which is the uh, third missionary journey of the apostle paul that's that's when he came to to ephesus and he spent three years there teaching establishing a church uh, teaching the saints and uh, that was somewhere between 53 and 57 a.d and uh, and then while paul was in prison later he wrote uh, the epistles of Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon. Now, there were some neighboring cities there that are mentioned in, Col in Colossians, and that's Laodicea, which is just north of Colossae, and Hierap Hierapolis, I don't believe is on the map, but it's right north of Laodicea. So these, these are all mentioned in, in this epistle. And it, the, the Bible tells us in Acts 19.10 that, uh, that all who lived in Asia, and this is the time that Paul was ministering in Ephesus, all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And it was during this time that probably soon or soon after that the uh, people in Colossae learned the gospel. They heard the gospel. And uh, Paul had not visited Colossae, he had not seen them. But uh, his fellow bondservant Epaphras was the one that brought the gospel there. And he, he was a native of Colossae. And uh, he, he reported to Paul about their faith for, in Christ and their love for the saints. And perhaps also informed Paul about the false teaching that was being propagated there in Colossae. So Paul wrote a letter to the church of Colossae while he was in prison in Rome, which is between 60 and 62 A.D. If we go to slide two, uh, we'll look at an outline of Colossians. I've, I looked at several of them. This is one out of the MacArthur Study Bible. I liked it the best. It's got three divisions. The first is personal matters, and that in, includes his greeting, his thankfulness, and his prayer. And then uh, the second is the doctrinal instructions. It's about Christ's deity, about Paul's ministry, and about the false philosophy being propagated. And then the third section is the practical exhortation, Christian conduct, Christian speech, Christian friends. And we'll go on to slide three. And uh, this is some of the contrasts that we find in Colossians. <clears throat> the Domain of darkness versus the kingdom of God's Son. The being, people being alienated and hostile in mind with evil deeds versus reconciled, holy and blameless, and beyond reproach. And then the third one is dead in trespasses and sins versus li alive in Christ with sins forgiven. The fourth one is indebted to decrees. And uh, the, uh, the versus a certificate of debt that was canceled. 
Fifth one is inflated by the fleshly mind versus holding Christ, fast to Christ. And uh, the sixth one is a life hidden with Christ versus when he is revealed, so are we. And then the seventh one is once walked in desires of the flesh, but now put them all off. And then the, the last one is having laid aside the old man, have put on the new man. So we won't need any slides now for a while. When Paul heard of the faith of the saints there in, in Colossae, and he, uh, this, this caused him to begin to pray for them. He had a heart for them, and he gave thanks. He knew that they were saints because it was God's work. That's a proper, you give thanks to the one who made them saints. So uh, I want you to notice Paul's prayer in verses 9 through 12. Uh, just, just notice what he prays for as I read these verses. For this reason also, since the day I heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you be filled with the knowledge of his will, with all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Well, I'm, I'm, I've gone past. That's as far as I wanted to read. Okay, this prayer begins with a request that they be filled with the knowledge of God's will. And this will must be realized, he says, through spiritual wisdom and understanding. The fact that the wisdom and understanding is, a spirit, is spiritual relates to the capacity of the person to receive it this knowledge and wisdom. The things of God are made known to men by the Holy Spirit, and the natural man has no capacity to receive the things of God because he does not possess the Holy Spirit. A believer has the capacity for such truth because the Holy Spirit makes it known to him. He is indwelt by the Spirit. The goals of this knowledge is so that the believer may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord and pleasing to Him. Notice that godly living starts in the heart. God is glorified in their lives as they bear fruit in every good work. Notice that such a faithful life results in an increasing knowledge of God. The infinite God allows His redeemed ones to get to know Him better and better. And I believe that this Increasing knowledge of God continues on into eternity. Finally, he prays for them to be strengthened with all power by the glorious might of the God who is omnipotent. We need this power to have steadfastness and patience. Uh, we, we need this in living for God and to face all the circumstances that his providence may get, uh, lead us into. This this, then we will give thanks joyously to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. And how did, this, how did he qualify us? Well, he sent his Son to satisfy uh, uh, his wrath against our sins so that he could forgive our sins and also impute the righteousness of his Son to us. He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his Son. Joyful thanks is the appropriate response to such grace. Verse 15 begins a description of the magnificence of Christ. Listen as I read uh, verses 15 through 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in heaven and the earth, visible and invisible, whether the thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities or things I, that have been created, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and all things in him, all things hold together. 
He is also the head of his body, the church. And he is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Christ is the, invi is the visible manifestation of the invisible God. He's the image of God because he is God. Firstborn of all creation cannot mean that Christ was created, as some cults teach, because he's the creator of all that was created. Firstborn here has the meaning of supremacy over creation. It was created by him and for him, and he created all things on the earth and in the heavens. All authorities and rulers, visible or invisible, were created by him. And this would be quite a blow to those who were advocating the worship of angels there in Colossae, rather than the worship of the Creator. Not only is Christ the Creator of all, He is also the one who holds His creation together. Christ is the head of the church. He is the first man to rise from the dead in a resurrection body. He will bring many more to glory. Even after we receive our resurrection body, Jesus will remain first place among us. All the creation was pleased to dwell in him. All the fullness, rather, I'm sorry. All the fullness was pleased to dwell in him. That's the way the LSB translated it, and I think that's the better translation of the Greek. That our NASB says the Father's good pleasure. Uh, well, it, it was the Father, but the... The, 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 fullness is, the fullness is the fullness of the Godhead. So it's all tr the Trinity, all three of the persons of the Trinity were pleased for the fullness of deity to dwell in, God, in Christ in bodily form. So what is this fullness? Colossians 2.9 tells us that all the fullness of deity dwells in him. And that's what I just mentioned, that the fullness of God, the fullness of the Trinity dwells in him. God himself became a man for the purpose of reconciling all things to himself, whether on earth or things in heaven. He made peace between himself and the men who were at enmity with him. And then at the cross, Jesus took care of the sin which had also negatively impacted the physical universe. It was after man fell that we started having other things happen that were not the best for, the, for our universe, for the creation. It seems that verse 120 goes beyond man to the creation, which was adversely affected by the fall. It says, to reconcile all things to himself, whether th things on earth or things in heaven. Romans 8.21 tells us that the creation itself will be set free from the slavery to corruption into the freedom of the children of God. But you... He reconciled to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. There is a, a, a caveat to this promise. If indeed you continue in the faith firmly established, established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you've heard. And does this mean that if you continue, does that mean that you must earn this blessed prospect by your perseverance? No, you don't earn it by that, but what it means is that the true disciple continues in Christ's word. If you do not continue, it means that you were never a true disciple. Jesus' plan was to build his church in the midst of a fallen world, using apostles to lay the foundation, and it was no surprise to them that they were to suffer for Christ's sake and the church's sake. Uh, or their their, their uh, ministry was for the church, of course. Jesus had told them that if they persecute me, they will persecute you. So Paul opens up to these, uh, these Christians in Colossae that he has never seen and tells them about his sufferings on their behalf. He says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share of uh, on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. 
I used to look at that and wonder, was, was not Christ suffering sufficient? What was lacking? What does it mean? Uh, does this mean that Christ's suffering were not sufficient to redeem the church? No, Christ had paid the full price of our redemption on the cross. Before he died, he said, it is finished. He finished all that was necessary to redeem us. The suffering that Paul was enduring was the sharing of Christ's sufferings in the ministry of the building up the church and bringing saints to maturity. It involves the preaching of the word of God, which he calls a mystery. Now, mystery in the New Testament is a truth that had not been previously revealed. God revealed truth to the apostles for them to make known to the church. Here, the facet of the mystery is referring to Christ in you, the hope of glory. The Old Testament predicted the coming of Messiah, so that wasn't new truth, but that the Messiah would actually indwell people, giving them the hope of glory was new. That had not been taught before. Such a ministry requires proclaiming, admonishing, teaching that each man may be made complete in Christ. And notice how Paul describes his ministry as I read chapter 1, verse 29 through uh, 2, 1. For this purpose I also labor, striving according to his power which mightily works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf and for those who have not, for those who are in Laodicea, and for all those who have not personally seen my face, he labors and strives, but not in his own power. Rather, it is God's power which mightily works within him. He wants the saints to know the great struggles he has for them, and for all who have not met him, including the saints in Laodicea, so that they will be encouraged. Paul wants them to find the true spiritual riches of wisdom and knowledge that are hidden in Christ so that they will not be persuaded by deceptive arguments from which are according to men's traditions. He also says that this false teaching is according to the elementary principles of the world. Now, I used to be an elementary principle, and I, that, so that term kind of got me, but it has nothing to do with, well, it does a little bit. The, uh, it has to do with rudimentary knowledge, and uh, it can mean that. And uh, so I, I was uh, elementary kids are starting out in a new. They're they're getting the basic foundation. So there is a some connection there. But this word uh, elementary principle is stoicheion in Greek, and it it was sometimes used in extra biblical Greek to refer to the elementary sounds or letters of the alphabet, in other words, the building blocks of language. But uh, in the Bible, it's used several different ways. In Hebrews 5.12, it refers to the rudimentary teachings of God's Word. The Hebrew Christians were, uh, were not progressing as they ought. By now they should have been teachers, but now they needed someone to teach them again the elementary principles of God's oracles. The elementary principles were necessary for a beginning Christian, but they needed to advance beyond the elementary principles about Christ and press on to maturity. In Galatians 4.9, the Christians faced the false teaching of the Judaizers. They taught that the Gentiles must keep the law in order to be saved. Paul asked, in light of their having coming to know God, why turn back to the weak and worthless elementary things? There's that word. Here the elementary things refers to the law. The law was given by God to point his people to Christ. But now that Christ has come, the believer is no longer under the law. The law could not save. It could not enable one to obey. And... Uh, 2 Peter 3, 10 and 12 uses this word in, in a different way. It's talking about the basic elements of the universe when it says that the elements will melt with intense heat when God destroys the earth. Well, in Colossians 2, 8 and 20, where these, this word is used each in each of those verses, elementary principles are the 
principles of the world, not of God. According to the Abbot Smith Greek lexicon, the story K on refers to the demons or tutelary spirits of nature. Peter O'Brien, in his commentary, translates the word elementary or elemental powers in verse eight, and in verse twenty, he he uh, translates the elementary spirits of the world. Christ's death on the cross dealt a blow to these powers or these these authorities, as we will soon see. Paul tells the the Colossians that in Christ, and all the fullness of uh, that all the fullness of deity dwells, and they are made full in Him. He wants them to understand the greatness of Christ and that He is all they need. Stay with Christ. Do not be misled by wrong teaching. As you received Him, so walk in Him. You are well founded. Keep growing in Christ. In 2, 12, 11 and 12, Paul uses language of two physical religious practices to illustrate what is spiritually true of the Colossians. And I'll just read those. Uh, that's 2, 11 and 12. It says, in, in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh of the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which also you were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. The first language is circumcision. The flesh uh, required uh, of the flesh that was required in the Old Testament covenant. The uh, second is the language of baptism required in the new covenant for those who have faith in Christ. They have been circumcised. The old uh, the Colossians have been circumcised without hands. That's a divine activity that removes the body of flesh, or it's the power of sin has been broken through Christ. And baptism speaks of their identification with Christ in His burial and His resurrection. Here they are not raised by human hands, but through faith in the working of God. This, is, this refers to divine activity, not water baptism. Only God can make one who is dead in transgressions alive together with Christ. And uh, that, that's in verses 15 through uh, uh, 13 to 15. I want to read those. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your f flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of death, debt, so consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he was, had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. At the cross, Christ did more than just pay the penalty for our sin. He also did away with the document that charged us as guilty. That is, the decrees that were against us and hostile to us were nailed to the cross. The law can no longer condemn us. There is now therefore no, no, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. In addition, he disarmed rulers and authorities by triumphing over them. Hebrews 2.14 tells us that through death, Christ rendered powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. What Christ accomplished on the cross is a springboard for Paul's admonishment to not be subject to the requirements of the false teaching being propagated at Colossae. That heresy, according to F.F. F. Bruce, seems to have been a blend of some of the highest elements of, of religion known to Judaism and of paganism. In fact, it became the philosophy of the false teachers. Food and drink, festival, new moon, philosophy... Uh, Sabbath, all are familiar in Judaism, and they were only shadows of what was to come. The reality belongs to Christ. The false teachers were delighting in self-abasement, worshiping of angels, visions that they have seen, and they are inflated without cause by a fleshly mind. How often false teaching contains attractive-sounding promises of spiritual or psychological benefits that might persuade those who are not well taught 
Teachers of such things are not from God. They are not holding fast to the head from, wh from whom the whole body grows. Their false humility and asceticism have the appearance of wisdom, but contains no power in the battle against sin. You have all need you you have all you need in Christ. Why would you let such people and such teaching rob you of the prize that you have in Christ? Paul introduces the practical ex or exhortation section of this letter with truths about their identification with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. Follow along as I read chapter 3, verses uh, 1 to 4. Therefore, if you are, have been raised with, up with Christ, keep se seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on things that are on the earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. Oh, I'm sorry. I uh, read it in my Bible. I've got it in my notes, too. I'm not going to read it twice. Our death with Christ is death to the things of the world our former life before we came to Christ. Our resurrection with Christ pla places our present life where Christ is. Christ is our life, and our life is hidden with Christ in God. In the future, Christ will be revealed, and we will be revealed. Now it is not obvious what we are, but then we'll be like him. We prepare for that day by continuing to seek the things above where Christ is, and by refra refraining from setting our minds on things of this earth. These truths introduce us to the uh, imperatives for Christian living. The first one in verse 5 is to consider the members of your body as dead to various sins. The more literal translation of the Greek is to put to death the bodily members which are on the earth. The bodily members refers to the sins of immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is equated with idolatry. That means anything that, that you value more highly than God. These are the kinds of sins that they did in their pre-Christ days. For, the, for, them, the wrath of, for these kind of things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. While the death of Christ has delivered us from the power of sin, the fact that we live in a fallen world and in a fallen body, we need vigilance to avoid practicing sin. The imperative section goes on. Uh, I'm going to read now uh, uh, verses 8 through 14. But now you also put, put, aside, put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth, do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jude, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, Christ is all and in all. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. In these verses, we have a sort of chiasm which goes from put off to put on. And we can have slide five now. Uh, they begin with what uh, we should put off because we have put off the old man and then it moves on to what we uh, have put on, uh, that we've put on the new man and therefore there's certain things that we should put on related to the new man. So uh, we'll just look at these. The, the uh, put aside... Uh, probably put off is would be a, the same thing as put aside. Put off these things, uh, anger, and you know the James says that the wrath, the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. 
This is not a holy anger. Uh, malice is a, an ill will. You desire somebody's hurt. You just don't. You, you don't. Don't. Uh, you got. You got evil intents on 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 them. Slander, abusive speech, and do not lie. Lying can mean telling outright untruths, but also stating things that may not be a lie in a context or that would lead the hearer to a conclusion which is different from the reality of uh, kind of a deceptive lying. Uh, this breeds distrust and leads to phony relationships. It can have a negative impact on harmonious relationships which should characterize the body of Christ. And it's not in keeping with the spirit of truth. Christians are to stop lying. And why? Because you've laid aside the old man with its practices. And you've put on the new man. Now this happened at, at regeneration. You, uh, in a sense, There's a sense in which you didn't do it. It's something that God did. In fact, it, it tells you there that, that putting on the new man, that was a... That new man is what God created in you at regeneration. This is the work of God. And uh, because you've put off the old man and put on the new man, you're, you're, you're to put off the things that are related to the old man. You're to put on the things that are related to this new man. And notice that this new man is being renewed into the image of its creator. In, in other words, we, we know that we were man was originally created in the image of God. We had we we were uh, and and uh, but that image has been damaged by the fall. It's not a as clear a reflection of God as it should be. God is in the business of creating a new humanity, renewing His image in them, so that again He restores what was lost in the fall. In fact, he gives us more than what was lost in the fall. What, what we have in redemption is, is a way greater than what we lost before, we, before man fell. Uh, we, we've, got, we've, we've got more heavenly uh, promises in the new life than we ever had in the old. And this, this renewal in the new man cuts across all ethnic and social distinctions, as it says here. And it, it's, it's again, it's another aspect of the mystery which was revealed in Ephesians 3, that, that Jew and Gentile and all, all different ethnic people are united in one body in Christ. And because you have put on the new man, we... We put on as God's elect, since you've come to know the kindness of God in his elect in you, uh, you, you put on the things that are the traits of your heavenly father, like a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with and forgiving others as the Lord forgave you. And above all these things, put on love which is the bond of unity. As Paul wrote in Galatians, the, the whole law is fulfilled in this one thing, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Then he says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you are called in one body. The people of God have, been, have peace with God. And if we're a group of people with peace with God, we should also have peace with one another. And in every circumstance which his providence brings into our lives. Notice that each verse in verses 15 through 17 ends with either thankfulness or gratitude. Uh, it's a proper response to grace. He says, let the word of Christ dwell richly within you, teaching, admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and with thankfulness to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks. In chapter 3, verses 8 to 21, we see that Christ makes a difference in, the, in family relationships. For the wife to be subject to her husband is fitting in the Lord, 
a wife who is in charge of her husband is not fitting with the biblical teaching of Christ's headship over the church and the husband's headship over the wife. A husband's love to his wife is patterned after Christ's love for the church. There's no place for harshness or bitterness toward his wife. Children should learn to please the Lord by obeying their, their parents. But this learning must begin with the parents' training of the children. Fathers should train their children in a way that does not exasperate them. A child who feels that he can never please his father may well become discouraged. In 322 uh, through 41, Christ makes a difference in business relationships. The slave and, or employee should give good service, but not so much to please his master as to please his heavenly father, his Lord, his, his heavenly Lord. The eternal reward has more weight than the temporary salary he gets. Likewise, wrongdoing has more serious consequences from above than it does from below. Wrongdoing may invite God's chastening now or result in suffering loss at the judgment seat of Christ. Masters or employers should treat their slaves or employees with justice and fairness, for they also are under a master who is in heaven. And then in verses, chapter 4, verses 2 to 4, we see that God, God's people should be committed to prayer, alert in prayer, and thankful in prayer. Their prayer should include effectiveness in the spread of the gospel. Even the Apostle Paul asked these Christians he's never met to pray for him that he may make the gospel clear. Then in verses 5 through 6, he admonishes them to be wise in their conduct and speech toward outsiders. Make the most of your opportunities. Paul is sending Tychicus a fellow worker to them to inform them about him and his circumstances and, and to encourage them. Onesimus, a native of their, of their community, will come with Tychicus. He sends greetings from his other fellow workers, including Mark, the one that he left, would not let go with him to work earlier. He's now useful. Epaphras, the man who brought them the gospel and who is from their community, community sends his greetings. And we learn here that this man's heart for the, and concern for the Colossians as well as for those that are in Hierapolis and those in Laodicea. He says that he labored earnestly for them in prayer that they may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. Paul asked the Colossians to convey his greetings to the brethren in Laodicea and to the church uh, house that's in uh, w the house of Nympha, the, the church that's there in her house, and after they read the letter, the, the the letters, their own respective letters, they're to exchange the letters with the with the Laodiceans, read each other's letters for their their well being. He ends this letter with an admonition to them to tell Archippus to fulfill his ministry that he has received in the Lord. They are to remember his imprisonment. And he wishes grace to be with them. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for this, this letter, this rich letter, which is, paints such a great picture of Christ and a, the, the, the all-sufficiency that he is for us. Pray, Father, that this week we may find that true. In Jesus' name, amen.